Dramatis Personae of the Tragedy of King Lear by William Shakespeare. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Lear, King of Britain, read by Craig Franklin. Goneril, eldest daughter to Lear, read by Thomas Peter. Regan, second daughter to Lear, read by Sonia. Cordelia, youngest daughter to Lear, read by Sonia. Duke of Albany, married to Goneril, read by Brad. Duke of Cornwall, married to Regan, read by Craig Franklin. King of France, read by Brad. Duke of Burgundy, read by Thomas Peter. Earl of Gloucester, read by Thomas Peter. Edgar, elder son to Gloucester, read by Sonia. Edmund, younger bastard son to Gloucester, read by Thomas Peter. Earl of Kent, read by Brad. Fool, read by Thomas Peter. Oswald, steward to Goneril, read by Sonia. Curran, a courtier, read by Brad. Old Man, tenant to Gloucester, read by Brad. Physician, read by Thomas Peter. First Officer, employed by Edmund, read by Sonia. Second Officer, read by Thomas Peter. Gentleman, attendant on Cordelia, read by Craig Franklin. Herald, Read by Craig Franklin. First servant to Cornwall. Read by Brad. Second servant to Cornwall. Read by Thomas Peter. Third servant to Cornwall. Read by Sonia. Knight attending on the king. Read by Thomas Peter. Messenger. Read by Craig Franklin. French messenger. Read by Brad. Captain, read by Brad. Stage directions, read by Brad. End of Dramatis Personae Act I of The Tragedy of King Lear by William Shakespeare This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, Please visit LibriVox.org. Act One, Scene One, A Room of State in King Lear's Palace. Enter Kent, Gloucester, and Edmund. I thought the king had more affected the Duke of Albany than Cornwall. It did always seem so to us, but now, in the division of the kingdom, it appears not which of the dukes he values most, for qualities are so weighed as curiosity and neither can make choice of either's merity. Is not this your son, my lord? His breeding, sir, hath been at my charge. I have so often blushed to acknowledge him that now I am raised to it. I cannot conceive you. Sir, this young fellow's mother could, <laughs> whereupon she grew round womb and that indeed sir a son for her cradle ere she had a husband for her bed do you smell a fault i cannot wish the fault undone the issue of it being so proper but i have a son sir by ward of law some year elder than this who yet is no dearer in my account though this knave came something saucily to the world before he was sent for Yet was his mother fair. There was uh, good sport at his making, and the horse must be acknowledged. Do you know this noble gentleman, Edmund? No, my lord. My lord of Kent. Remember him hereafter as my honourable friend. My services to your lordship. I must love you and sue to know you better. Sir, I shall study deserving. He has been out nine years, and away he shall again. Ah, 
the king is coming. Senate within. Enter Lear, Cornwall, Albany, Goneril, Regan, Cordelia, and attendants. Attend the lords of France and Burgundy Gloucester. I shall, my lord. Exeunt Gloucester and Edmund. Meantime, we shall express our darker purpose. Give me the map there. Know that we have divided in three our kingdom, and it is our first intent to shake all cares and business from our age, conferring them on younger strengths while we unburdened crawl toward death. Our son of Cornwall and you, our no less loving son of Albany, we have this hour a constant will to publish. Our daughter's several dowers, that future strife may be prevented now. The princes, France and Burgundy, great rivals in our youngest daughter's love, long in our court have made their amorous sojourn. And here are to be answered. Tell me, my daughters, since now we will divest us both of rule, interest of territory, cares of state. Which of you, shall we say, doth love us most, that we our largest bounty may extend, when nature doth with merit challenge, Goneril, our eldest-born, speak first. Sir, I love you more than word can wield the matter, dearer than eyesight, space, and liberty, beyond what can be valued, rich or rare, no less than life with grace health beauty honour as much as child e'er loved or father found a love that makes breath poor and speech unable beyond all manner of so much i love you cordelia aside what shall cordelia speak love and be silent of all these bounds even from this line to this with shadowy forests, and with champagnes richard, with plenteous rivers and wide-skirted meads, we make thee lady, to thine and Albany's issue. Be this perpetual, what says our second daughter? Our dearest Regan, wife of Cornwall, speak. Sir, I am made of the self metal as my sister, and prize me at her worth. In my true heart I find she names my very deed of love. Only she comes too short, that I profess myself an enemy to all other joys which the most precious square of sense possesses, and find I am alone felicitate in your dear highness love. Cordelia aside. Then poor Cordelia, and yet not so since i am sure my love's more ponderous than my tongue to thee and thine hereditary ever remain this ample third of our fair kingdom no less in space validity and pleasure than that conferred on goneril now our joy although the last and least to whose young love the vines of france and milk of burgundy strive to be interest what can you say to draw a third more opulent than your sister's? Speak. Nothing, my lord. Nothing? Nothing. Nothing will come of nothing. Speak again. Unhappy that I am, I cannot heave my heart into my mouth. I love your majesty according to my bond, no more nor less. How, how, Cordelia, mend your speech a little, lest you mar your fortunes. Good, my lord, you have begot me, bred me, loved me. I return those duties back as are right fit, obey you, love you, and most honour you. Why have my sisters husbands, if they say they love you all? Happily, when I shall wed, that lord whose hand must take my plight, shall carry half my love with him 
half my care and duty sure i shall never marry like my sisters to love my father all but goes thy heart with this ay my good lord so young and so untender so young my lord and true let it be so thy truth then be thy dower for by the sacred radiance of the sun the mysteries of hecate and the night by all the operation of the orbs from whom we do exist and cease to be here i disclaim all my paternal care propinquity and property of blood and as a stranger to my heart and me hold thee from this for ever the barbarous Scythian, or he that makes his generation messes to gorge his appetite shall to my bosom be as well neighboured pitied and relieved as thou my sometime daughter good my liege peace kent come not between the dragon and his wrath i loved her most and thought to set my rest on her kind nursery to cordelia hence and avoid my sight so be my grave my peace as here i give her father's heart from her call france who stirs call burgundy call more albany with my two daughters dowers digest this third let pride which she calls plainless marry her i do invest you jointly with my power pre-eminence and all the large effects the troop with majesty ourself by monthly course with reservations of an hundred knights by you to be sustained shall our abode make with you by due turn only we shall retain the name and all the additions to a king the sway revenue execution of the rest beloved sons be yours which to confirm this coronet part between you giving the crown royal lear whom i have ever honoured as my king loved as my father as my master followed as my great patron thought on in my prayers the bow is bent and drawn make from the shaft let it fall rather though the fork invade the region of my heart be kent unmannerly when lear is mad what wouldst thou do old man think'st thou that duty shall have dread to speak when power to flattery bows to plainness honours bound when majesty falls to folly reverse thy state and in thy best consideration check this hideous rashness answer my life my judgment thy youngest daughter does not love thee least nor are those empty-hearted whose low sounds reverb no hollowness kent on thy life no more my life i never held but as a pawn to wage against thine enemies ne'er fair to lose it thy safety being the motive out of my sight see better lear and let me still remain the true blank of thine eye now by apollo now by apollo king thou swearest thy gods in vain o oh, vassal miscreant laying his hand on his sword dear, dear sir, sir forbear, forbear kill thy physician and the phoebus stow upon the foul disease revoke thy gift or whilst i can vent clamour from my throat i'll tell thee thou dost evil hear me recreant on thine allegiance hear me since thou hast sought to make us break our vows which we durst never yet and with strained pride to come betwixt our sentences and our power which nor our nature nor our place can bear our potency made good take thy reward five days we do allot thee for provision to shield thee from disasters of the world and on the sixth to turn thy hated back upon our kingdom if on the next day following thy banished trunk be found in our dominion the moment is thy death away by jupiter this shall not be revoked fare thee well king saith thus thou wilt appear freedom lives hence and banishment is here to cordelia 
the gods to their dear shelter take thee maid that justly thinkst and hast most rightly said to goneril and regan and your large speeches may your deeds approve that good effects may spring from words of love thus kent o princes bid you all adieu he'll shape his old course in a country new exit flourish re-enter gloucester with france burgundy and attendants here's france and burgundy my noble lord my lord of burgundy we first address towards you who with this king hath rivalled for our daughter what in the least will you require in present dower with her or cease your quest of love most royal majesty i crave no more than hath your highness offered nor will you tender less right noble burgundy when she was dear to us we did hold her so but now her price is fallen sir there she stands if aught within that little seeming substance or all of it with our displeasure pieced and nothing more may fitly like your grace she is there and she is yours i know no answer will you with those infirmities she owes unfriended new adopted to our hate dowered with our curse and strangered with our oath take her or leave her pardon me royal sir election makes not up in such conditions then leave her sir for by the powers that made me i tell you all her wealth to france for you great king i would not from your love make such a stray to match you where i hate therefore beseech you to avert your liking a more worthier way than on a wretch whom nature is ashamed almost to acknowledge hers this is most strange that she whom even but now was your best object the argument of your praise balm of your age the best the dearest should in this trice of time commit a thing so monstrous to dismantle so many folds of favour sure her offence must be of such unnatural degree that monsters it or your forevouched affection fall into taint which to believe of her must be a faith that reason without miracle should never plant in me i yet beseech your majesty if for i want that glib and oily art to speak and purpose not since what i well intend i'll do it before i speak that you make known it is no vicious blot murder or foulness no unchaste action or dishonoured step that has deprived me of your grace and favour but even for want of that for which i am richer a still soliciting eye and such a tongue as i am glad i have not though not to have it hath lost me in your liking better thou hadst not been born than not to have pleased me better is it but this a tardiness in nature which often leaves the history unspoke that it intends to do my lord of burgundy what say you to the lady loves not love when it is mingled with regards that stand aloof from the entire point will you have her she is herself a dowry royal king give but that portion which yourself proposed and here i take cordelia by the hand duchess of burgundy nothing i have sworn i am firm i am sorry then you have so lost a father that you must lose a husband peace be with burgundy since that respects of fortunes are his love i shall not be his wife fairest cordelia that art most rich being poor most choice forsaken and most loved despised thee and thy virtues here i seize upon be it lawful i take up what's cast away gods gods tis strange that from their cold's neglect my love should kindle to inflamed respect thy dowerless daughter king thrown to my chance is queen of us of ours and our fair france 
not all the dukes of waterish burgundy can buy this unprized precious maid of me bid them farewell cordelia though unkind thou losest here a better where to find hm, thou hast her france let her be thine for we have no such daughter nor shall ever see that face of hers again therefore be gone without our grace our love our benison come noble burgundy flourish exeunt lear burgundy cornwall albany gloucester and attendants bid farewell to your sisters the jewels of our father with washed eyes cordelia leaves you i know you what you are and like a sister am most loath to call your faults as they are named love well our father to your professed bosoms i commit him but yet alas stood i within his grace i would prefer him to a better place so farewell to you both prescribe not us our duties let your study be to content your lord who hath received you at fortune's arms you have obedience scanted and well are worth the one that you have wanted time shall unfold what plighted cunning hides who covers faults at last shame derides well may you prosper come my fair cordelia exeunt france and cordelia sister it is not little i have to say of what most nearly appertains to us both i think our father will hence to-night that's most certain and with you next month with us you see how full of changes his age is the observation we have made of it hath not been little he always loved our sister most and with what poor judgment he hath now cast her off appears too grossly tis the infirmity of his age yet he has ever but slenderly known himself the best and soundest of his time hath been but rash then must we look from his age to receive not alone the imperfections of long engrafted condition but therewithal the unruly waywardness that infirm and choleric years bring with them such unconstant starts are we like to have from him as this of ken's banishment there is further compliment of leave taken between france and him pray you let us sit together if our father carry authority with such disposition as he bears this last surrender of his will but offend us we shall further think of it we must do something and in the heat exeunt scene two a hall in the earl of gloucester's castle enter edmund with a letter thou nature art my goddess to thy law my services are bound wherefore should i stand in the plague of custom and permit the curiosity of nations to deprive me for that i am some twelve or fourteen moonshines lag of a brother why bastard wherefore base when my dimensions are as well compact my mind as generous and my shape as true as honest madam's issue why brand they us with base with baseness bastardy base base who in the lusty stealth of nature take more composition and fierce quality than doth within a dull stale tired bed go to the creating a whole tribe of fops got tween asleep and wake well then legitimate edgar i must have your land our father's love is to the bastard edmund as to the legitimate fine word legitimate well my legitimate if this letter speed and my invention thrive edmund the base shall top the legitimate i grow i prosper now gods stand up for bastards enter gloucester kent banished thus and france and cola parted and the king gone to-night 
prescribed his power, confined exhibition. All this done upon the guard. Edmund, how now? What news? So please, your lordship, none. Putting up the letter. Why so earnestly seek you to put up that letter? I know no news, my lord. What paper were you reading? Nothing, my lord. No? What needed then that terrible dispatch of it into your pocket? The quality of nothing hath not such need to hide itself. Let's see. Come, if it be nothing, I shall not need spectacles. I beseech you, sir, pardon me. It is a letter from my brother that I have not all o'er read, and for so much as I have perused, I find it not fit for your own looking. Give me the letter, sir. I shall offend either to detain or give it. The contents, as in part I understand them, are to blame. Let's see. Let's see. I hope, for my brother's justification, he wrote this but as an essay, or taste of my virtue. Gloucester reads. <laughs> this policy and reverence of age makes the world bitter to the best of our times, keeps our fortunes from us till our oldness cannot relish them. I begin to find an idle and fond bondage in the oppression of aged tyranny, who sways not as it hath power, but as it is suffered. Come to me, that of this I may speak more. If our father would sleep till I waked him, you should enjoy half his revenue for ever, and live the beloved of your brother Edgar. Oh, conspiracy! Sleep till I wake him, you should enjoy half his revenue. <laughs> My son Edgar, has he a hand to write this? A heart and brain to breed it in? When, when came this to you? Who brought it? It was not brought me, my lord. There's the cunning of it. I found it thrown in at the casement of my closet. You know the character to be your brother's? If the matter were good, my lord, I durst swear it were his. But in respect of that, I would fain think it were not. It is his. It is his hand, my lord. But I hope his heart is not in the contents. Has he never before sounded you in this business? Never, my lord. But I have heard him oft maintain it to be fit that, sons at perfect age, and fathers declined, the father should be as ward to the son, and the son manage his revenue. Ah, villain! Villain! His very opinion in the letter. Abhorred villain! Unnatural, detested, brutish villain! Uh, worse than brutish. Go, Sarah, seek him. I'll apprehend him. Abominable villain. Where is he? I do not well know, my lord. If it shall please you to suspend your indignation against my brother till you can derive from him better testimony of his intent, you should run a certain course. Where, if you violently proceed against him, mistaking his purpose, it would make a great gap in your own honour, and shake in pieces the heart of his obedience. I dare pawn down my life for him, that he hath writ this to feel my affection to your honour, and to no other pretence of danger. Think you so? If your honour judge it meet, I will place you where you shall hear us confer of this, and by an auricular assurance have your satisfaction, and that without any further delay than this very evening. Here cannot be such a, a monster nor is not sure to his father that so tenderly and entirely loves him heaven and earth edmund seek him out wind me into him i pray you frame the business after your own wisdom i would unstate myself to be in a due resolution I will seek him, sir, presently. Convey the business as I shall find means, and acquaint you with all. 
These light eclipses in the sun and moon portend no good to us, though the wisdom of nature can reason of us and thus, yet nature finds itself scourged by the sequent effects. Love cools, friendship falls off, brothers divide, in cities, mutinies, in countries, discord, in palaces, treason, and the bond cracked twixt son and father. This villain of mine comes under the prediction. There's son against father. The king falls from bias of nature. There's father against child. We have seen the best of our time. Machinations, hollowness, treachery, and all ruinous disorders follow us disquietly to our graves. Find out this villain, Edmund. It shall lose thee nothing. Do it carefully. And the noble and true-hearted Kent banished. Here's the fence, honesty. Tis strange. Exit. This is the excellent foppery of the world, that, when we are sick in fortune, often the surfeits of our own behaviour, we make guilty of our disasters the sun, the moon, and the stars, as if we were villains on necessity, fools by heavenly compulsion, knaves, thieves, and treacherous by spherical predominance, drunkards, liars, and adulterers by an enforced obedience of planetary influence, and all that we are evil in by a divine thrusting on. An admirable evasion of hormas to man, to lay his goatish disposition to the charge of a star. My father compounded with my mother under the dragon's tail, and my nativity was under Ursa Major, so that it follows I am rough and lecherous. <laughs> I should have been that I am, had the maidenly a star in the firmament twinkled on my bastardizing. Enter Edgar. Pat, he comes, like the catastrophe of the old comedy. My cue is villainous melancholy, with a sigh, like Tom a Bedlam. Oh, these eclipses do portend these divisions. Ah, so la me. How now, brother Edmund? What serious contemplation are you in? I am thinking, brother, of a prediction I read this other day. What should follow these eclipses? Do you busy yourself with that? I promise you, the effects he writes of succeed unhappily as of a naturalness between the child and the parent. Death, dearth, dissolutions of ancient amities, divisions in state, menaces and maledictions against king and nobles, needless diffidences, banishment of friends, dissipation of cohorts, nuptial breaches, and I know not what. How long have you been a sectary astronomical? Come, come. When saw you my father last? The night gone by. Spake you with him? Aye, two hours together. Parted you in good terms? Found you no displeasure in him, by word nor countenance? None at all. Bethink yourself wherein you may have offended him, and at my entreaty forbear his presence until some little time hath qualified the heat of this displeasure, which at this instant so rages in him that with the mischief of your person it would scarcely allay. Some villain hath done me wrong. That's my fear. I pray you, have a continent forbearance till the speed of his rage goes slower, and, as I say, retire with me to my lodging, from whence I will fitly bring you to hear my lord speak. Pray ye, go. There's my key. If you do stir abroad, go armed. Armed, brother? Brother, I advise you to the best. I am no honest man, if there be any good meaning toward you. I have told you what I have seen and heard. But faintly, nothing like the image and horror of it. Pray you, away. Shall I hear from you anon? I do serve you in this business. Exit, Edgar. A credulous father. 
and a brother noble whose nature is so far from doing harms that he suspects none on whose foolish honesty my practices ride easy i see the business let me if not by birth have lands by wit all with me's meat that i can fashion fit exit scene three a room in the duke of albany's palace enter goneril and oswald did my father strike my gentleman for chatting of his fool ay madam by day and night he wrongs me every hour he flashes into one gross crime or other that sets us all at odds i'll not endure it these knights grow riotous and himself abrades us on every trifle when he returns from hunting i will not speak with him say i am sick if you come to lag former services you shall do well the fault of it i'll answer horns within he's coming madam i hear him put on what weary negligence you please you and your fellows i'd have it come to question if he distaste it led him to our sister whose mind and mine i know in that are one not to be overruled <sighs> idle old man that still would manage those authorities that he hath given away now by my life old fools are babes again and must be used with checks as flatteries when they are seen abused remember what i have said very well madam and let his knights have colder looks among you what grows of it no matter advise your fellow so i would breed from hence occasions and i shall that i may speak i write straight to my sister to hold my very course prepare for dinner exeunt scene four a hall in albany's palace enter kent disguised if but as well i other accents borrow that can my speech diffuse my good intent may carry through itself to that full issue for which i raised my likeness now banished kent if thou canst serve where thou dost stand condemned so may it come thy master whom thou lovest shall find thee full of labours horns within enter king lear knights and attendants let me not stay a jot for dinner go get it ready exit an attendant how now what art thou a man sir what dost thou profess what wouldst thou with us i do profess to be no less than i seem to serve him truly that will put me in trust to love him that is honest to converse with him that is wise and says little to fear judgment to fight what i cannot choose and to eat no fish what art thou a very honest-hearted fellow and as poor as the king if thou beest as poor for a subject that he's for a king thou art poor enough what wouldst thou service who wouldst thou serve you dost thou know me fellow no sir but you have that in your countenance which i would fain call master what's that authority what services canst thou do i can keep honest counsel ride run mar a curious tale in telling it and deliver a plain message bluntly that which ordinary men are fit for i am qualified in and the best of me is diligence how old art thou not so young sir to love a woman for singing nor so old to dote on her for anything i have years on my back forty-eight follow me thou shalt serve me if i like thee no worse after dinner i will not part from thee yet dinner ho oh, dinner where's my knave my fool go you and call my fool hither exit an attendant enter oswald you you sirrah where's my daughter so please you exit what says the fellow there Call the clot pole back. Exit a knight. Where's my fool? Oh, I think the world's asleep. Re enter knight. How now? Where's that mongrel? He says, my lord, your daughter is not well. 
Why came not the slave back to me when I called him? Sir, he answered me in the roundest manner. He would not. He would not? My lord, I know not what the matter is, but to my judgment your highness is not entertained with that ceremonious affection as you were wont. There is a great abatement of kindness appears, as well in the general dependence, as in the duke himself also, and your daughter. Ha! Huh. Seest thou so? I beseech you pardon me, my lord, if I be mistaken, for my duty cannot be silent when I think your highness wronged. Thou but rememberest me of mine own conception. I have perceived a most faint neglect of late, which I have rather blamed as my own jealous curiosity than as a very pretense and purpose of unkindness. I will look further into it. But where's my fool? I have not seen him this two days. Since my young lady's going into France, sir, the fool hath much pined away. No more of that. I have noted it well. Go you and tell my daughter I would speak with her. Exit attendant. Go you, call hither my fool. Exit another attendant. Re-enter Oswald. Oh, you, sir. You. Come you hither, sir. Who am I, sir? My lady's father. My lady's father? My lord's knave? You horse and dog, you slave, you cur. I am none of these, my lord. I beseech your pardon. Do you bandy looks with me, you rascal? Striking him. I'll not be struck, my lord. Nor trip neither, you base football player. Tripping up his heels. I thank thee, fellow. Thou servest me, and I'll love thee. Come, sir, arise, away. I'll teach you differences, away, away. If you will measure your lover's length again, tarry, but away, go to. Have you wisdom? So. Pushes Oswald out. Now, my friendly knave, I thank thee. There's earnest of thy service. Giving Kent money. Enter fool. Let me hire him too. Here's my coxcomb. Giving Kent his cap. How now, my pretty knave? How dost thou? Sirrah, you were best take my coxcomb. Why, fool? Why, for taking one's part that's out of favour? Nay, and thou canst not smile as the wind sits, thou'lt catch cold shortly. There, take my coxcomb. Why, this fellow has banished two and's daughters, and did the third a blessing against his will. If thou follow him, thou must needs wear my coxcomb. How now, my uncle? Would I... <sighs> had two coxcombs and two daughters why my boy if i gave them all my living i'd keep my coxcombs myself there's mine beg another of thy daughters take heed sirrah the whip truce a dog must to kennel he must be whipped out when the lady brack may stand by the fire and stink a pestilent girl to me sirrah i'll teach thee a speech do mark it nuncle have more than thou showest speak less than thou knowest lend less than thou owest ride more than thou goest Learn more than thou trowest, set less than thou throwest. Leave thy drink and thy whore, and keep in a door, and thou shalt have more than two tenths to a score. This is nothing, fool. <sighs> then tis like the breath of an unfeed lawyer. You gave me nothing for it. Can you make no use of nothing, Nuncle? Why, no, boy, nothing can be made out of nothing. Fool to Kent. Prithee, tell him. 
so much the rent of his land comes to he will not believe a fool a bit of fool dost thou know the difference my boy between a bitter fool and a sweet one no lad teach me that lord that counselled thee to give away thy land come place him here by me do thou for him stand the sweet and bitter fool will presently appear the one in motley here the other found out there dost thou call me fool boy all thy other titles thou hast given away that thou wast born with this is not altogether fool my lord no faith lords and great men will not let me if i had a monopoly out they would have part on and ladies too they will not let me have all the fool to myself they'll be snatching uncle give me an egg and i'll give thee two crowns what two crowns shall they be why after i cut the egg in the middle and eat up the meat the two crowns of the egg when thou clovest thy crown in the middle and gavest away both parts thou borest thine ass on thy back o'er the dirt thou hadst little wit in thy bald crown when thou gavest thy golden one away if i speak like myself in this let him be whipped that first finds it so fools had ne'er less grace in a year for wise men are grown foppish and know not how their wits to wear their manners are so apish when will you want to be so full of songs sirrah i have used it nuncle ere since thou madest thy daughters thy mothers for when thou gavest them the rod and puts down thine own breeches then they for sudden joy did weep and i for sorrow song that such a king should play bo peep and go the fools among prithee nuncle keep a schoolmaster that can teach thy fool to lie i would fain learn to lie and you lie sirrah we'll have you whipped i marvel what kin thou and thy daughters are <laughs> they'll have me whipped for speaking true thou'lt have me whipped for lying and sometimes i am whipped for holding my peace <sighs> i had rather be any kind of thing than a fool and yet i would not be thee uncle thou hast paired thy wit to both sides and left nothing in the middle here comes one of the pairings enter goneril how now daughter what makes that frontlet on methinks you are too much of late to the frown thou wast a pretty fellow when thou hadst no need to care for her frowning now thou art an o oh, without a figure i am better than thou art now i am a fool thou art nothing <laughs> to goneril yes forsooth i will hold my tongue so your face bids me though <laughs> you say nothing mum mum he that keeps nor crust nor crumb weary of all shall want some pointing to lear that's a shield peace god not only sir this your all licensed fool but other of your insolent retinue do hourly carp and quarrel breaking forth in rank and not to be endured rise sir i had thought by making this well known unto you to have found a safe address but now grow fearful by what yourself too late have spoken done that you protect this course and put it on by your allowance which if you should the fault will not escape sensual nor the redress of sleep which in the tender of a wholesome wheel might in their work and do you that offence which else was shame that their necessity were called discreet proceeding 
for you know nanko the hedge sparrow fed the cuckoo so long that it had it had bit off by its young so out went the candle and we were left darkling are you our daughter come sir i would you would make use of that good wisdom whereof i know you are fraught and put away these dispositions which of late transform you from what you rightly are may uh, not an ass know when the cart draws the horse <laughs> john <laughs> i love thee doth any here know me this is not leah doth leah walk thus speak thus where are his eyes either his notion weakens his discernings a lethargic ha waking tis not so who is it that can tell me who i am hmm lear's shadow i would learn that for by the marks of sovereignty knowledge and reason i should be false persuaded i had daughters which they will make an obedient father your name fair gentlewoman this admiration sir is much of the favour of other your new pranks i do beseech you to understand my purposes aright as you are old and reverend you should be wise here do you keep a hundred knights and squires men so disordered so debauched and bold that this our court infected with their manners shows like a riotous inn epicurism and lust makes it more like a tavern or a brothel than a grace palace the shame itself doth speak for instant remedy be then desired by her that else will take the thing she begs a little to disquantity your train and the remainder that shall still depend to be such men as may besort your age which know themselves and you darkness and devils settle my horse call my train together degenerate bastard i'll not trouble thee yet have i left a daughter you strike my people and your disordered rabble make servants of their betters enter albany whoa the too late repents to albany oh, sir are you come is it your will speak sir prepare my horses ingratitude thou marbled hearted fiend more hideous when thou showest the inner child than the sea monster pray sir be patient lear to goneril detested kite thou liest my train are men of choice and rarest parts that all particulars of duty know and in the most exact regard support the worship of their name o oh, most small fault how ugly didst thou in cordelia show which like an engine wrenched my frame of nature from the fixed place drew from my heart all love and added to the girl oh leah 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 striking his head beat at this gate that let thy folly in and thy dear judgment out go go my people my lord i am guiltless as i am ignorant of what hath moved you it may be so my lord here nature here dear goddess here suspend thy purpose if thou didst intend to make this creature fruitful into her womb convey sterility dry up in her the organs of increase and from her derogate body never spring a babe to honour her if she must teem create her child of spleen that it may live and be a thwart disnatured torment to her let it stamp wrinkles in her brow of youth with cadent tears fret channels in her cheeks turn all her mother's pains and benefits to laughter and content that she may feel how sharper than a serpent's tooth it is to have a thankless child away away exit now gods that we adore whereof comes this never afflict yourself to know more of it but let his disposition have that scope that dotage gives it re-enter lear what fifty of my followers at a clap within a fortnight what's the matter sir i'll tell thee to goneril life and death i am ashamed 
that thou hast power to shake my manhood thus that these hot tears which break from me perforce should make thee worth them bless and fogs upon thee the untinted woundings of a father's curse pierce every sense about thee old fond eyes beweep this cause again i'll pluck ye out and cast you with the waters that you lose to temper clay ha let it be so i have another daughter who i am sure is kind and comfortable when she shall hear this of thee with her nails she'll flay thy wolfish visage thou shalt find that i'll resume the shape which thou dost think i have cast off for ever exeunt lear kent and attendants do you mark that i cannot be so partial goneril to the great love i bear you pray you content what oswald ho oh? to the fool you sir more knave than fool after your master uncle lear uncle lear tarry and take the fool with thee a fox one one has caught her and such a daughter should sure to the slaughter if my cap would buy a halter so the fool follows after <laughs> exit this man hath had good counsel a hundred nights tis politic and safe to let him keep at point a hundred nights yes that on every dream each buzz each fancy each complaint dislike he may engard his dotage with their powers and hold our lives in mercy oswald i say well you may fear too far safer than trust too far let me still take away the harms i fear not fear still to be taken i know his heart what he hath uttered i have writ my sister if she sustains him in his hundred nights, when I have showed the unfitness. Re-enter Oswald. How now, Oswald? What, have you writ that letter to my sister? Ay, madam. Take you some company, and away to horse. Inform her full of my particular fear, and thereto add such reasons of your own as may compact it more. Get you gone, and hasten your return. Exit Oswald. No, no, my lord. This milky gentleness and course of yours, though I condemn not, yet under pardon you are much more a task for want of wisdom than praise for harmful mildness. How far your eyes may pierce, I cannot tell. Striving to better, oft we mar what's well. Nay, then. Well, well, the event. Exeunt. Scene five court before the duke of albany's palace enter lear kent and fool go you before to gloucester with these letters acquaint my daughter no further with anything you know than comes from her demand out of the letter if your diligence be not speedy i shall be there afore you i will not sleep my lord till i have delivered your letter exit If a man's brains were in his heels, we're not in danger of kipes. Ay, boy. Then I prithee be merry. Thy wit shall not go slipshod. Ha, ha, ha. Shalt see thy other daughter will use thee kindly. For mm, though she's as like this as a crab's like an apple, yet I can tell what I can tell. What canst tell, boy? She'll taste as like this as a crab does to a crab. Thou canst tell why one's nose stands in the middle on face. Mm, no. Why? To keep one's eyes of other side's nose, that what a man cannot smell out, he may spy into. I did her wrong. Canst tell how an oyster makes his shell no nor i neither but i can tell why a snail has a house why <laughs> why to put set in not to give it away to his daughters and leave his horns without a case 
i will forget my nature so kind a father be my horses ready thy asses are gone about em the reason why the seven stars are no more than seven is a pretty reason because they are not eight yes indeed thou wouldst make a good fool to take it again perforce monster ingratitude if thou wert my fool uncle i'd have thee beaten for being old before thy time how's that thou shouldst not have been old till thou hadst been wise oh let me not be mad not mad sweet heaven keep me in temper i would not be mad enter gentleman how now are the horses ready ready my lord come boy she that's a maid now and laughs at my departure shall not be a maid long unless things be cut shorter <laughs> exeunt end of act one act two of the tragedy of king lear by william shakespeare this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org act two scene one a court within the castle of the earl of gloucester enter edmund and curran meeting save thee curran and you sir i have been with your father and given him notice that the duke of cornwall and regan his duchess will be here with him this night how comes that nay i know not you have heard of the news abroad i mean the whispered ones for they are yet but ear-kissing arguments not i pray you what are they have you heard of no likely wars twixt the two dukes of cornwall and albany not a word you may do then in time fare you well sir exit the duke be here to-night the better best this weaves itself perforce into my business my father has set guard to take my brother and i have one thing of a queasy question which i must act briefness and fortune work brother a word descend brother i say enter edgar my father watches oh sir fly this place intelligence is given where you are hid you have now the good advantage of the night have you not spoken against the duke of cornwall he is coming hither now in the night in the haste and regan with him have you nothing said upon his party against the duke of albany advise yourself i am sure on it not a word i hear my father coming pardon me in cunning i must draw my sword upon you draw seem to defend yourself now quit you well yield come before my father light ho here fly brother torches torches so farewell exit edgar some blood drawn on me would beget opinion of my more fierce endeavour wounds his arm i have seen drunkards do more than this in sport father father stop stop no help enter gloucester and servants with torches now edmund where's the villain here stood he in the dark his sharp sword out mumbling of wicked charms conjuring the moon to stand auspicious mistress but where is she look sir i bleed where is the villain edmund fled this way sir when by no means he could pursue him ho go after excellent servants by no means what persuade me to the murder of your lordship but that i told him the revenging gods against parasites did all their thunders bend spoke with how manifold and strong a bond the child was bound to the father 
sir in fine seeing how low the opposite i stood to his unnatural purpose in fell motion with his prepared sword he charges her my unprovided body latched mine arm but when he saw my best alarmed spirits bold in the quarrel's right roused to the encounter or whether gasted by the noise i made full suddenly he fled let him fly far not in this land shall he remain uncaught and found dispatched the noble duke my master my worthy arch and patron comes to-night by his authority i will proclaim it that he which finds him shall deserve our thanks bringing the murderous coward to the stake he that conceals him death when i dissuaded him from his intent and found him pied to do it with cursed speech i threatened to discover him he replied thou unpossessing bastard dost thou think if i would stand against thee would the reposal of any trust virtue or worth in thee make thy words faith no what i should deny is this i would ay though thou didst produce my very character i turn it all to thy suggestion plot and damned practice and thou must make a dullard of the world if they not thought the profits of my death were very pregnant and potential spurs to make thee seek it ah strange and fastened villain would he deny his letter said he now i never got him tuck it within hark the duke's trumpets oh, i know not why he comes all ports i'll bar the villain shall not escape the duke must grant me that besides his picture i will send far and near that all the kingdom may have do note of him and of my land loyal and natural boy i'll work the means to make thee capable enter cornwall regan and attendants how now my noble friend since i came hither which i can call but now i have heard strange news if it be true all vengeance comes too short which can pursue the offender how dost my lord oh madam my old heart is cracked it's cracked what did my father's godson seek your life he whom my father named your edgar oh lady lady shame would have it hid was he not companion with the riotous knights that tend upon my father i know not madam tis too bad too bad yes madam he was at that consort no marvel then though he were ill affected this day hath put him on the old man's death to have the expense and waste of his revenues i have this present evening from my sister been well informed of them and with such cautions that if they come to sojourn at my house i'll not be there nor i assure thee regan edmund i hear that you have shown your father a childlike office it was my duty sir he did bray his practice and received this hurt you see striving to apprehend him is he pursued ay my good lord if he be taken he shall never more be feared of doing harm make your own purpose how in my strength you please for you edmund whose virtue and obedience doth this instant so much commend itself you shall be ours natures of such deep trust we shall much need you we first seize on i shall serve you sir truly however else for him i thank your grace you know not why we came to visit you thus out of season threading dark-eyed night occasions noble gloucester of some poise wherein we must have use of your advice our father he hath writ so hath our sister of differences 
which i best thought it fit to answer from our home the several messengers from hence attend dispatch our good old friend lay comforts to your bosom and bestow your needful counsel to our business which craves the instant use i serve you madam your graces are right welcome exeunt flourish scene two before gloucester's castle enter kent and oswald severally good dawning to thee friend art of this house ay where may we set our horses uh, the mire prithee if thou lovest me tell me i love thee not why then i care not for thee if i had thee in lipsbury pinfold i would make thee care for me why dost thou use me thus i know thee not fellow i know thee what dost thou know me for a knave a rascal an eater of broken meats a base proud shallow beggarly three-suited hundred pound filthy worsted stocking knave a lily-livered action-taking horse and glass gazing super service of a finical rogue one trunken heriting slave one that would be a bawd in way of good service and ought nothing but the composition of a knave beggar coward pander and the son and heir of a mongrel bitch one whom i will beat into clamorous whining if thou deniest the least syllable of thy addition why what a monstrous fellow art thou thus to rail on one that's neither known of thee nor knows thee what a brazen-faced varlet art thou to deny thou knowest me is it two days ago since i tripped up thy heels and beat thee before the king draw you rogue for though it be night yet the moon shines i'll make a sop of the moonshine of you draw you horse and cullionly barber monger draw drawing his sword away i have nothing to do with thee draw you rascal you come with letters against the king and take vanity the puppet's part against the royalty of her father draw you rogue or i'll so carbon out of your shanks draw you rascal come your ways help ho oh, murder help strike you slave stand rogue stand you neat slave strike beating him help ho oh, murder murder Enter Edmund, Cornwall, Regan, Gloucester, and servants. How now? What's the matter? Part. With you, goodman boy, if you please. Come, our fleshy. Come on, young master. Arms? What's the matter here? Keep peace. Upon your lives he dies that strikes again. What is the matter? The messengers from our sister and the king. What is your difference? Speak i am scarce in breath my lord no marvel you have so bestirred your valour you cowardly rascal nature disclaims in thee a tailor made thee thou art a strange fellow a tailor make a man ay a tailor sir a stone-cutter or a painter could not have made him so ill though he had been but two years at the trade speak yet how grew your quarrel this ancient ruffian sir whose life i have spared at suit of his grey beard thou horse and zed thou unnecessary letter my lord if you give me leave i will tread this unbolted villain into mortar and daub the walls of a jakes with him spare my grey beard you wagtail peace sirrah you beastly knave know you no reverence yes sir but anger hath a privilege why art thou angry that such a slave as this should wear a sword who wears no honesty such smiling rogues as these like rats oft bite the holy cords a-twain which are too entrenched to unloose smooth every passion that in the natures of their lords rebel bring oil to fire snow to their colder moods renege affirm and turn their halcyon beaks with every gale and vary of their masters knowing not like dogs but following a plague upon your epileptic visage smile you my speeches as i were a fool goose if i had you upon sarum plain i'll drive ye cackling home to camelot what art thou mad old fellow how fell you out? 
say that no contraries hold more antipathy than i and such a knave why dost thou call him knave what is his fault his countenance likes me not no more perchance does mine or his or hers sir tis my occupation to be plain i have seen better faces in my time than stands on any shoulder that i see before me at this instant this is some fellow who having been praised for bluntness doth affect a saucy roughness and constrains the garb quite from his nature he cannot flatter he an honest mind and plain he must speak a truth and they will take it so if not he's plain these kind of knaves i know which in this plainness harbour more craft and more corrupter ends than twenty silly ducking observants that stretch their duties nicely sir in good faith in sincere verity under the allowance of your great aspect whose influence like the wreath of radiant fire on flickering phoebus front what meanest by this to go out of my dialect which you discommend so much i know sir i am no flatterer he that beguiled you in a plain accent was a plain knave which for my part i will not be though i should win your displeasure to entreat me to it what was the offence you gave him i never gave him any it pleased the king his master very late to strike at me upon his misconstruction when he compact and flattering his displeasure tripped me behind being down insulted railed and put upon him such a deal of man that worthied him got praises of the king for him attempting who was self-subdued and in the flashment of his dread exploit drew on me here again none of these rogues and cowards but ajax is their fool fetch forth the stocks you stubborn ancient knave you reverend braggart we'll teach you sir i am too old to learn call not your stocks for me i serve the king on whose employment i was sent to you you shall do small respect show too bold malice against the grace and person of my master stalking his messenger fetch forth the stocks as i have life and honour there shall he sit till noon till noon till night my lord and all night too why madam if i were your father's dog you should not use me so sir being his knave i will stocks brought out this is a fellow of the self-same colour our sister speaks of come bring away the stocks let me beseech your grace not to do so if his fault is much and the good king his master will check him for it your purposed low correction is such as basest and condemnedest wretches for pilferings and most common trespasses are punished with the king must take it ill that he so slightly valued in his messenger should have him thus restrained i'll answer that my sister may receive it much more worse to have her gentleman abused assaulted for following her affairs put in his legs kent is put in the stocks come my good lord away exeunt all but gloucester and kent i am sorry for thee friend tis the duke's pleasure whose disposition all the world well knows will not be rubbed nor stopped i'll entreat for thee pray do not sir i have watched and travelled hard some time i shall sleep out the rest all whistle a good man's fortune may grow out at heels give you good morrow the looks to blame in this twill be ill taken exit good king that must approve the common saw thou out of heaven's benediction comes to the warm sun approach thou beacon to this underglobe that by thy comfortable beams i may peruse this letter nothing almost sees miracles but misery i know tis from cordelia who hath most fortunately been informed of my obscured course and shall find time from this enormous state seeking to give losses their remedies all weary and o'erwatched 
Take vantage, heavy eyes, not to behold this shameful lodging. Fortune, good night. Smile once more, turn thy wheel. He sleeps. Scene three. The open country. Enter Edgar. I heard myself proclaimed, and by the happy hollow of a tree escaped the hunt. No port is free no place that guard and most unusual vigilance does not attend my taking while i may scape i will preserve myself and am be thought to take the basest and most poorest shape that ever penury in contempt of man brought near to beast my face i'll grime with filth blanket my loins elf all my hair in knots and with presented nakedness outface the winds and persecutions of the sky the country gives me proof and precedent of bedlam beggars who with roaring voices strike in their numbed and mortified bare arms pins wooden pricks nails sprigs of rosemary and with this horrible object from low farms poor pelting villages sheep coats and mills sometime with lunatic bands sometime with prayers enforce their charity poor turly god poor tom that's something yet edgar i nothing am exit scene four before gloucester's castle kent in the stocks enter lear fool and gentleman tis strange that they should so depart from home and not send back my messenger as i learned the night before there was no purpose in them of this remove hail to thee noble master ha ah, makes thou this shame thy pastime no my lord <laughs> he wears cruel garters horses are tied by the heads dogs and bears by the neck monkeys by the loins and men by the legs when a man is over lusty at legs then he wears wooden nether stocks what's he that hath so much thy place mistook to set thee here it is both he and she your son and daughter no yes no i say i say yea no no they would not yes they have by jupiter i swear no by juno i swear i they durst not do it they could not would not do it tis worse than murder to do upon respect such violent outrage resolve me with all modest haste which way thou mightst deserve or they impose this usage coming from us my lord when at their home i did commend your highness letters to them ere i was risen for the place that showed my duty kneeling came there a reeking post stewed in his haste half breathless panting forth from goneril his mistress salutations delivered letters spite of intermission which presently they read on those contents they summoned up their meany straight took horse commanded me to follow and attend the leisure of their answer gave me cold looks and meeting here the other messenger whose welcome i perceived had poisoned mine being the very fellow which of late displayed so saucily against your highness having more man than wit about me drew he raised the house with loud and coward cries your son and daughter found this trespass worth the shame which here it suffers winter's not gone yet if the wild geese fly that way fathers that wear rags do make their children blind but fathers that bear bags shall see their children kind fortune that errand tore ne'er turns the key to the poor but for all this thou shalt have as many dolors for thy daughters as thou canst tell in a year oh how this mother swells up towards my heart hysterica passio down thou climbing sorrow thy elements below where is this daughter with the earl sir here within follow me not stay here exit 
made you no more offence but what you speak of none how chance the king comes with so small a number and thou hadst been set i the stocks for that question thou hadst well deserved it why fool we'll set thee to school to an ant to teach thee there's no labouring in the winter all that follow their noses are led by their eyes but blind men and there's not a nose among twenty but can smell him that's stinking let go thy hold when a great wheel runs down a hill lest it break thy neck with following it but the great one that goes upward let him draw thee after when a wise man gives thee better counsel give me mine again i would have none but knaves follow it since a fool gives it Ahem. that sir which serves and seeks for gain and follows but for form will pack when it begins to rain and leave thee in the storm but i will tarry the fool will stay and let the wise man fly the knave turns fool that runs away the fool no knave per die well lend you this fool not i the stocks fool enter lear and gloucester deny to speak with me they are sick they are weary they have travelled all the night mere fetches the images of revolt and flying off fetch me a better answer my dear lord you know the fiery quality of the duke how unremovable and fixed he is in his own course vengeance plague death confusion fiery what quality why gloucester gloucester i'd speak with the duke of cornwall and his wife well my good lord i have informed them so informed them dost thou understand me man i my good lord the king would speak with cornwall the dear father would with his daughter speak commands ten service are they informed of this my breath and blood fiery the fiery duke tell the hot duke that no but not yet maybe he is not well infirmity doth still neglect all office where too our health is bound we are not ourselves when nature being oppressed commands the mind to suffer with the body i'll forbear and am fallen out with my more headier will to take the indisposed and sickly fit for the sound men looking on kent death on my state wherefore should he sit here this act persuades me that this remotion of the duke and her is practice only give me my servant forth go tell the duke and his wife i'd speak with them now presently bid them come forth and hear me or at their chamber door i'll beat the drum till it cry sleep to death i would have all well betwixt you exit oh me my heart my rising heart but down cry to it nuncle as the cockney did to the eels when she put him in the paste alive she napped him all the cock's combs with a stick and cried down wantons down twas their brother that in pure kindness to his horse buttered his hay enter cornwall regan gloucester and servants good morrow to you both hail to your grace kent here set at liberty i am glad to see your highness regan i think you are i know what reason i have to think so if thou shouldst not be glad i would divorce me from thy mother's tomb sepulchring an adulteress to kent oh are you free some other time for that beloved regan thy sister's naught oh regan she hath tied sharp tooth done kindness like a vulture here points to his heart i can scarce speak to thee thou'lt not believe with how depraved a quality oh regan i pray you sir take patience 
i have hope you less know how to value her desert than she to scant her duty say how is that i cannot think my sister in the least would fail her obligation if sir perchance she have restrained the riots of your followers tis on such grounds and to such wholesome end as clears her from all blame my curse is on her oh sir you are old nature in you stands on the very verge of her confine you should be ruled and led by some discretion that discerns your state better than you yourself therefore i pray you that to our sister you do make return say you have wronged her sir ask her forgiveness do you but mark how this becomes the house dear daughter i confess that i am old kneeling age is unnecessary on my knees i beg that you'll vouchsafe me raiment bed and food good sir no more these are unsightly tricks return you to my sister lear rising never regan she hath abated me of half my train looked black upon me struck me with her tongue most serpent-like upon the very heart all the stored vengeances of heaven fall on her ingrateful top strike her young bones you take it airs with lameness fie sir fie you nimble lightnings dart your blinding flames into her scornful eyes infect her beauty you fen sucked fogs drawn by the powerful sun to fall and blast her pride oh the blessed gods so will you wish on me when the rash mood is on no regan thou shalt never have my curse thy tender hefted nature shall not give thee o'er to harshness her eyes are fierce but thine do comfort and not burn tis not in thee to grudge my pleasures to cut off my train to bandy hasty words to scant my sizes and in conclusion to oppose the bolt against my coming in thou better knowest the offices of nature bond of childhood effects of courtesy dues of gratitude thy half for the kingdom hast thou not forgot wherein i thee endowed good sir to the purpose who put my man in the stocks tuck it within what trumpet's that i know it my sisters this approves her letter that she would soon be here enter oswald is your lady come this is a slave whose easy borrowed pride dwells in the fickle grace of her he follows out varlet from my sight uh, what means your grace who stocked my servant regan i have good hope thou didst not know it who comes here oh heavens enter goneril if you do love old men if your sweet sway allow obedience if yourselves are old make it your cause send down and take my part to goneril art not ashamed to look upon this beard oh regan wilt thou take her by the hand why not by the hand sir how have i offended all's not offence that indiscretion finds and dotage terms so oh sides you are too tough will you yet hold how come my man i the stocks i set him there sir but his own disorders deserved a much less advancement you did you i pray you father being weak seems so if till the expiration of your month you will return and sojourn with my sister dismissing half your train come then to me i am now from home and out of that provision which shall be needful for your entertainment return to her and fifty men dismissed no rather i abjure all roofs and choose to wage against the enmity of the air to be a comrade with a wolf and owl necessity's sharp pinch return with her 
Why, the hot-blooded France that doubtless took our youngest born, I could as well be brought to knee his throne, and squire like pension big, to keep base life afoot, return with her. Persuade me rather to be slave and sumpter to this detested groom. Pointing to Oswald. The, at your choice, sir. I prithee, daughter, do not make me mad. I will not trouble thee, my child, farewell. We'll no more meet, no more see one another. Be yet thou art my flesh, my blood, my daughter, or rather a disease that's in my flesh, which I must needs call mine. Thou art a boil, a plague sore, or embossed carbuncle in my corrupted blood. But I'll not chide thee. Let shame come when it will. I do not call it, I do not bid the thunder-bearer shoot, nor tell tales of thee to high-judging Jove. Mend when thou canst, be better at thy leisure. I can be patient, I can stay with Regan. I and my hundred knights. Not altogether so. I look not for you yet, nor am provided for your fit welcome. Give ear, sir, to my sister. For those that mingle reason with your passion must be content to think you old, and so... But she knows what she does. Is this well spoken? I dare avouch it, sir. What, fifty followers? Is it not well? What should you need of more? Yea, or so many, sith that both charge and danger speak against so great a number. How in one house should many people under two commands hold amity? Tis hard, almost impossible. How might not you, my lord, receive attendance from those that she call servants, or for mine? Why not, my lord? If then they chance to slack you, we could control them. If you will come to me, for now I spy a danger, I entreat you to bring but five and twenty. To no more will I give place or notice. I gave you all? And in good time you gave it. Made you my guardians, my depositories, but kept a reservation to be followed with such a number. What must I come to you with five and twenty? Regan, said you so? And speak it again, my lord, no more with me. Those wicked creatures yet do look well favoured when others are more wicked. Not being the worst, stands in some rank of praise. To Goneril. I'll go with thee. Thy fifty yet doth double five and twenty, and thou art twice her love. Hear me, my lord. What need you five and twenty? Ten or five? To follow in a house where twice so many have a command to tend you. What need one? Oh, reason not the need. Our basest beggars are in the poorest things superfluous. Allow not nature more than nature needs. Man's life is cheap as beasts. Thou art a lady, if only to go warm with gorgeous. Why, nature needs not what thou gorgeous wearest, which scarcely keeps thee warm, but for true need. You heavens, give me that patience, patience I need. You see me here. You gods, a poor old man, as full of grief as age, wretched in both. If it be you that stirs these daughters' hearts against their father, fool me not so much to bear it tamely. Touch me with noble anger, and let not woman's weapons water drop stain my man's cheeks. No, you unnatural hags, I will have such revenges on you both, that all the world shall... I will do such things. What they are yet, I know not, but they shall be the terrors of the earth. You think I'll weep? No, I'll not weep. Storm and Tempest I have full cause of weeping, but this heart shall break into a hundred thousand flaws, or ere I'll weep. Oh, fool, I shall go mad. Exeunt Lear, Gloucester, Kent, and Fool. Let us withdraw, twill be a storm. This house is little, 
the old man and his people cannot be well bestowed tis his own blame hath put himself from rest and must needs taste his folly for his particular i'll receive him gladly but not one follower so am i purposed where is my lord of gloucester enter gloucester followed the old man forth he is returned the king is in high rage whither is he going he calls the horse but will i know not whither tis best to give him way he leads himself my lord entreat him by no means to stay alack the light comes on and the high winds do sorely ruffle how many miles about they are scarce a push oh sir to wilful men the injuries that they themselves procure must be their schoolmasters shut up your doors he is attended with a desperate train and what they may incense him to being apt to have his ear abused wisdom bids fear shut up your doors my lord tis a wild night my regan counsels well come out of the storm exeunt end of act two